My guest tonight on State of Affairs has been described by many as a ball of fire and one of Africa's fastest rising entrepreneurs. What is his narrative for Africa and what does he think about the growing narrative for Africa because he has a vision to transform Africa. Nana Kwame Bidiako, well known as Cheddar, is my guest on State of Affairs for tonight. You're welcome to the show. Thank you, Nana. Okay, so Thank which one do you prefer, Nana Kwame Bidiako or Cheddar? Well, my parents named me Nana Kwame Bidiya. Mm -hmm. But um, for some reason, Cheddar is just a name that has grown with me while I've been growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, I prefer to be called by my birth name. Nana Kwame Bidiya. Sure. All right, so, now, I mean, I, I've, I've read your profile, I've seen your port business portfolio, and you're growing at a very fast rate. My first question would be what it is like to do business in Ghana. Because over the years, you see ratings for doing business in Africa and Ghana doesn't sit at the top we don't sit at the bottom as well but there are you know suggestions that we could do better for a businessman of your sort what do you think about doing business in Ghana well first of all business is one thing of its own and a country is one thing on its own and whenever you want to bring the two together you have to respect the regulations the conditions the rules for business and then the country on its own. Mm -hmm. You have to respect its culture mm -hmm. and tradition. That tells you the mindset of people. Well, for every bu businessman that is successful, should simply know how to add value to people. Right. And to be able to add value to people, you need to understand their mindsets. So first of all, the, the answer to your question is to relate your business to the culture of the country, mm -hmm. which is very important. This is something that I did. I understand the mindset of Ghanaians. I understand the mindset of Africans. I even understand the mindset of the experts who are coming in. Mm. So this is more relative to the concept of the business that I do. And I think it's one of the engines, mm. or my secret engines, that makes everything moves a bit faster. Yeah. Now, people talk about the bureaucracy in the system. Uh, for instance, if you set out to register your business, you're either going to oil somebody's hand or you have to wait for a long time. Do you get frustrated by the system for uh, an experienced businessman like you? I, I do. I mean, but I don't let such things bring me down mm. because whatever you set your mind to, you have to find a way to execute it. Now, but if you don't, then you become the loser. But then if you do execute it or overcome whatever challenges, it makes you a winner. Mm -hmm. For us as businessmen or entrepreneurs, our biggest boss is to win. Mm. In every venture that we go closer or every step that we take, we just want to be a winner. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like gambling. You know, you go in and you come back out as a winner. Mm -hmm. And so even though we have these consequences and all these issues of backdoor business before you penetrate or before any doors are open for you, I find a way to let it positively inspire me and motivate me that what if I can find a better way not to be trapped mm -hmm. by one of these consequences, but a better way to be able to slip through and come out successful. Okay. Which but do you think it's something that can change? I mean, you have found a way around it, but you, you still find people complaining that the system is wearing them out and it is also giving rise to corruption. Do you think it's something we can change? Since you talked about mindset. I think so, but I, I don't think the people who are committing such crimes are the ones who have to change to change the system. Mm -hmm. It's rather the people who are complaining and blaming mm -hmm. are the ones who have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. See, I believe that we need to change what is inside us. If we want to develop our country as Ghana, then first of all, we need to develop ourselves from inside. I'll tell you a joke. So I was driving with my family, my wife and my three kids, in somewhere in California, very nice area. And uh, we had ice cream and we were eating something else in the car. And I think one of my kids dropped something, like a rubber or something, mm -hmm. on the floor. Then this guy driving his car pulled up, a white guy. He got out of his car. He didn't say anything to us. He picked the rubber and walked across the street and went to put it in the bin. You know what? 
for like five seconds. I didn't know what to say, whether to get out of my car and say, oh, I'm sorry. Or I just didn't know what to say, but I kept my cool and I also swallowed whatever disgrace and said, <laughs> wow, this guy is passionate about his country. He's passionate about his environment, the look of the place. You know, he is worried about what has been built should be kept that way for the next centuries. Right. And I feel like this is how we Africans should start to feel before people will start calling us all sort of names all over the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to start to clean up. We need to be proud of what God has given us as a country, as a continent, that we have all the resources, we have all the commodities, we have everything the world needs. Mm -hmm. So how come we're still struggling? How come we are corrupt? How come, you know, there's all the negatives and minuses? I think it's all based on us. To, to make a change. Okay, so it takes me to a question that I had in mind for you since you talked about the perceptions people have about Africa because recently uh, the US president made some very disparaging remarks about Africa and a lot of Africans were outraged uh, by his comments. There was a backlash uh, for him and you know calls on him to apologize. On the other hand you have people saying that he was right because if you come to Africa and in 2018 Women are dying because they cannot get a bed to deliver on in a hospital. Then his comments were right, all justified. What do you think? Well, personally, I wouldn't say his comments were right. You know, the beginning of success starts from fearing the Lord. However, the world is God's creation. It's not our creation. So right. I wouldn't be able to have that will, that power, to call a continent such a name. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like it's completely wrong to label a, com uh, a continent, you know, with such a label. But at the same time, I feel like these words should motivate us, should inspire us to let us turn whatever names they're calling us to paradise. These are the things. How do we do that? Well, first of all, I mean, if you didn't like how your mom looked and you didn't like how you look, you start by doing something about how you look first. Mm. Change your looks. And when you change your looks, it might affect your mom. Your mom might even feel like, wow, was it that easy? So we start to change ourselves by starting from us, making sure that our habits, our self-built character, our attitude, our perception, our vision, our ambition is channeled in a positive way. You know, uh, I'll give you a good example. When you are to describe the average Ghanaian, He's very kind, very jealous, and very peaceful. Now, I'll explain it further so you understand. You might walk into someone's house. They will offer you a bottle of water. Kindly offer you a bottle of water. But as soon as you get up going on your way out, he can say, look at this one. He's so broke now. He can't even afford for water. Yeah. And if you heard this person and say, Akosia, did you say this about me? He would say, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let's, let's move on. He'll make peace with you. Now, these three things doesn't move us forward. When you go to a place like Nigeria, which is a neighboring country, these people are very aggressive and confident. See, that's their culture. It's so fast for a Ghanaian that they don't even understand what is happening. My problem is, why does Africa as a continent is adopting 800 and something cultures? Why can't it be one traditional culture? And why are people adopting attitudes that make us sincerely dubious with a humanitarian character? Why are you shielding yourself? What is there that you're hiding that you can't bring out that will add value to someone else's life? And the worst of it all, I really think that we need to start adding value to our own people. You know, especially in Ghana. Ghana is about time they start to embrace success. They start to embrace wisdom, respect, and dignity, integrity. You know, we don't easily become who we are overnight. Mm -hmm. There is nothing such as luck. Chances come for the prepared mind. And when you see one that has a prepared mind, you need to learn to appreciate them. Because I don't see that person who is behind some organization that have to blame somebody first before they get paid. Somebody that have to put someone in trouble because when there's trouble, that's when some people get paid. I'm asking myself this question. How is his grandson gonna get paid? Right. How is his child gonna get paid? 200 years from now, what if people don't live by the corrupt ways anymore? What is going to happen? So it's about time 
that we really start to appreciate things. I mean, my success probably came from me appreciating the greatest people in this world. And not only that, but I also started correcting myself from the greatest people's greatest mistakes. Not my own mistakes. Yes, I do correct myself from my own mistakes. But I look at some great people in this world and how they messed up. So growing up, my mentor was Solomon. And this guy has been the greatest guy for me of all time because he's been the most wealthiest person and the wisest person that ever lived on this planet. But his latter mistake sort of ripped his empire apart. And that's where my fascination came from. I wanted to find out what really turned this man apart, you know, and I learned from it. And so we as Ghanaians especially, you know, I was start with Ghana, but this is more to Africa and, and, and the entire, you know, continent, that we need to start to respect the value of who we are. There, there is tribalism, there are other things in the country that it's just holding us back from going forward. What do you think about our politics? Well, maybe I'd like to finish this tribalism thing before we go into politics, but I am thinking that why, why do we have to think Ashantis are different from Ghans and Ghans are different from Airways? But as soon as you come out of this boundary, we are all considered as Ghanaians. The minute that we come out of the African boundary, we are all considered as Africans. Mm -hmm. See, so we are one people. We are black. We're Africans, we're Ghanaians, we're Airways, whatever. You can't do anything about it. This is who we are. And it's about time. This is 2018. It's about time the young ones who are coming up, the ones who have already grown, to accept that this, are, this is who we are. We cannot change it. We can only make it better. We can only add value. Like that man that picked the litter up and put it in the bin, trying to clear his space and clean it up. You know, trying to clean his own mess because he knows he's responsible for that. And I think this would be the beginning of success. This is what would change the mentality of this young Africans coming up and old Africans understanding, why do I have to put my thumb on something and vote for somebody? Because of the value that they have for the people and the country. It's about time. Okay. So you think our politics is okay? Is it decent? Well, Can we do better? I mean, when it comes to African politics, it, it, it looks like a religion to me. <laughs> Maybe it's a religion, okay? Because It's close it, to that. I, I mean, if, if you saw a minister or a president in a church, he didn't come there to worship God. He came to campaign. So it tells you that they believe in that realms and that sector more. However, I also believe that when someone is empowered, they're empowered because people believe that they have the ability, the capacity, you know, to lead a country, to change a country, to shape a country, to shape people's lives. And I'm beginning to expect more of that from our leaders. Do you, do you see that? I mean, we have been enjoying this dispensation for a very long time, over a decade. Do you see politics, policies, and the leaders we choose changing the narrative? Are they impacting properly on the youth? I, I think so. I mean, look, I don't expect it to be done in a few decades. Africa has, Africans have only been practicing democracy for the past 60 years. However, we didn't put this constituency together. This is something that is built from the Western that has been initiated uh, onto our systems. But there have been people who have truly practiced it. You know, I've seen us, you know, leaders gone to court or flag bearers gone to court, spent a year, you know, you know, going through a judiciary system of electoral rights and so forth. And, you know, there was no fight. You know, in fact, I looked at that as we practiced it even better than the people that introduced it. So I believe that there is future. However, we come back to the same mindset of the people. The mindset of the people is the government. The government is not just the, the cabinet. It's the government, it's the other people. You know, what the people do right actually changes the government. The government or the president might have a, a good vision to change the country, but there could be someone sitting right at the door of, a, of an entity or of an organization who have just decided that, hey, give me backhand or you're not going in. <laughs> so, you know, it, it takes time, but eventually when people start to understand the value of what life is, they will finally know what money is worth.
Mm. You know, because if you're chasing money and you don't understand the value of life, you will never know what it's worth, mm. which is very important because everyone seems to be chasing riches. But I believe in wealth. And to be able to gain wealth, you need to have value for life. Okay. Now, I'll pick your thoughts pretty soon on the economy. Uh, but since you're talking about leadership, I'd like to run this by you. In 2016, somewhere in 2016, um, when everyone was busy assessing what Africa's problems are, Kofi Annan, uh, the former UN Secretary General, said that the biggest problem, he said, in fact, he said is the only problem facing Africa is a leadership crisis. Do you agree? Do we have a leadership crisis? Um, in, in a way, I agree to understand. Okay. Of course, Kofi Annan will always have his opinion as the UN Secretary and as a, a leader mm. you know, of our generation. And I, I support him in many ways. Uh, leadership, it's one thing. But the question is, what is leadership? Because most Africans think that leadership is someone that we have to follow. No, I don't believe that is leadership. Because that person that has been empowered could be empowered by some other country or some other people or some other organization in the world who will be probably being controlled as a puppet. So if we look at leadership that way, we could be swinging our whole selves as a country into a valley of someone's trap. So I wouldn't per se say that is based on that section or sector of leadership. Right. I, 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 I strongly think that it's us in general, you know, because if you have a bad habit and your brother adopts it and your sister adopts it and your family adopts it, they will label your family as a bad family. Mm. But if one member of your family has a good sense of leadership, that could cover your badness. Mm -hmm. You know, that could save your mom from being called a bad mother, you know, so we should be proud of some of the leaders who are coming out of us. They don't necessarily have to be a president or a pastor, but it could be anybody. It could be an entrepreneur. It could be a pastor. It could be a president. But as long as we detect and determine that there is genuineness in their vision, in their movement, we have to support them. You know, I feel like my people sometimes don't like what is too good. This is why I started this interview by saying that we should learn to embrace success. Because once you appreciate it, you start to see the depths of it. Why is it so good? Okay. And, and this is what I believe that leadership is. We have it. Okay. We're not just appreciating it. We're not crowning it. We're not valuing it. So it looks valueless. But we do have it. We do have great leadership great sense of leadership. All right. Uh, let's take a break. When we come back, you know, over the last few weeks, we've been talking to politicians, ordinary Ghanaians on the streets about the state of the economy. For the first time, we get to speak to a businessman who is doing marvelous things on the continent and right here in Ghana. So we'll pick his thoughts on the state of the economy when we come back. This is State of Affairs. We'll be right back. Welcome back to State of Affairs. My guest tonight is Nana Kwame Bidiako. He's president, founder, and CEO of Qualis Group. And we've been talking about doing business in Africa, doing business in Ghana, and how do we change Africa's story? Well, now, I want to talk to you about the economy. Uh, because if you speak to different people, they have different thoughts on the economy. If you get to speak to a politician whose party is in power, they'll tell you the economy is buoyant, it is great. You speak to a politician from the opposition, they'll tell you the economy is tattered, it is worse than ever. You speak to the ordinary people on the streets and they'll tell you different things. Like, oh, we don't have money in our pockets. So yeah, this one is going well or that one is not going well. For businessmen who are employing people every day, for somebody like you who is putting up massive constructions like these ones, what is the state of the economy? I think the economy is good today. Um, what does economy depend on 
first of all, it needs economical balance in every sense. The way of living, the way of demands, the way of exportation, importation, manufacturing, you know, things to do with industrialization and development, you know, which all sort of evolves around the manifesto of whatever government that is in power. So it actually needs a foundation of corporate governance that it's revolving around national issues being resolved, which I think today it's much better. You can see it yourself if you look at the graphics of you know, economical growth. Uh, Ghana is growing. Uh, Ghana is becoming more open. It's becoming in more... Fact, the World Bank says that in 2018, they're projecting Ghana to be the fastest growing economy. It had been before somewhere in 2011, 2010. Ghana was one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Then all of a sudden, it sort of came back. So me as a developer, me as an entrepreneur and a visionary, I had to figure out what is the cause of this. And one of the things that I figured out whilst I was trying to f you know, figure out the issue, mm -hmm. why we have been deprived from that fastest growing economy label, I realized that, yes, we have discovered a lot of products and commodities and, and minerals and you know, so forth, whatever. But what's the point of having a fastest growing economy and your development is running behind schedule? Okay. That's a great gap that needs to be bridged. I mean, I'll break it down properly. If somebody had to travel to Ghana to invest in an oil block or in some sort of ag agriculture farm, they come here, remember they have their family behind, if they like the country, they invite their wife first. Mm -hmm. Then if their wife comes and she likes the country, they bring their children and they start to find schools and slowly they become a part of the economy mm -hmm. as well as of the country. Now, we don't have any development that can, should I say, complement such interesting parties or in interesting investors who are interested to invest in our country. Mm -hmm. And so people come into our countries with a mind of coming in, extracting what they need, and going out. Mm -hmm. These are some of the things that affect a fast-growing economy. And today, I think maybe the current government is looking at sort of bridging those gaps and making the country become more investor-friendly, you know, um, making sure that tax incentives are not way too high mm -hmm. for the average Ghanaian to live by let alone the foreigner right. who is coming in. So it's part of the things that is changing the economy. And there are good ideas like the one district, one factory, yeah. you know, which I believe that the future of Africa will be based on how we create platforms for our industrialization, you know, um, uh, ideas and visions. We need manufacturing hubs, you know. 92% of the things in the country are imported. So where are we making money from? Because right. <laughs> we're importing stuff and we're paying taxes to bring them in and we're having to sell them five times the cost to our targeted audience. Now, if you live in a country where you know the average wages is $300 or $200 for someone who has a wife and four children to live on two or $300 a month, if you want to sell something to them for the price, five times the price, come on, you quit, you're squeezing everything mm -hmm. out of the economy. So that governmental uh, bridge, bridging that they're, they're, they're closing some of the gaps. It's also sort of nurturing the economy, you know, it's, it's opening up. And this time, I hope that 2018, as you said, if Ghana becomes one of the fastest growing economies in the world, we don't slip back again. You know, I, I pray for Ghana for a good government Ghana, governance and also to be very focused on the citizens, to be able to have some citizen rights in terms of employment in terms of construction, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of, you know, the basic development. Okay. So one will look around and say that despite all the challenges, you are braving all the odds. You're one of the most successful young men in this country. What is it that you do that others are not doing? Well, it, first of all, it starts with my people. You know, I live for the people. I, if I wanted to live for myself, then I already have enough to live. Mm -hmm. But the things that I do is based on the inspiration that I get from how my people are today. You know, I remember when I was in college, uh, one, of my, one of my biggest 
uh, ultimatum or should I say wish or whatever that I wanted to do was to make sure that Africans were respected. You know, and this was in England. But you had like the Jamaicans, you had the Africans, and the Jamaicans had sort of turned their back on us. <laughs> so, you know, before I left England to come back to Africa, which was 2001, 2002, to pursue my vision, unlike Martin Luther, I didn't have any dream. I had a vision. And I was coming here because I had always wanted to put Africans on a map. And I did it even way back when I was in college, in university, in, on the streets of London. And so coming to Africa, I always wanted to do something that would tell the others standing outside my box that look we can also do it you know and not only just do it but we can also do it right and today when i look at my people and look at the country the nation it inspires me you know that woman with a pan on the head wearing slippers with dust on her feet yet we say there's malaria all over the place that gutter that is open you know i want to close it i want to be able to develop my country that it, even if it's not going to become like Dubai, someone can also come from Dubai and stay here <laughs> and feel happy. I want to add value to society. For me, that is what I see as wealth. I don't believe in riches. I believe in wealth. And even if people misunderstood wealth as riches, this is wealth for me. Wealth is changing the world, impacting the world, creating a legacy that is attached one without you even having to have any connect with them or without you having to be related to them generally you just want to add value to your people this is one of my biggest secrets and of course above all things is God I, I know some people don't believe in God but as long as you have a religion that you know that there is something above you that worst scenario you can negotiate with you know sometimes i feel like picking up my mobile phone and, and call god and say hey <laughs> hey i paid my tithes you know so what's happening i, yeah. I need my stuff now you know yeah. it's like i have a bond with him some of these things i learned when i was growing up of course um i grew up with my mother and uh she's been a spiritualist this is the woman that i named my group after some of the buildings after qualis um very soon the world will see the story of me coming out from the home of my mother and to the streets, to the world, and be able to take a pawn of the government state and operate in the corporate world, but all from a woman. All from a woman. Right. It's interesting you brought up uh, the issue of a woman, you know, because that was my next question. Great. Because, um, I mean, empowerment, women's empowerment, is growing in leaps and bounds, you know, everywhere in the world. Uh, not to even bring in the issue of uh, the usual sexual harassment stories that come here and there. But do you feel that the African woman is getting enough opportunities? I wouldn't just limit it to an African woman. I would just say woman in general. You know, because every woman is a woman and every man is a man. The only thing that differs is the colors. Mm. However, Every man is chasing the same thing, and every woman wants the same thing. Mm -hmm. you know, so I, I would be more generational about it and more general about mm -hmm. it. I think it's women in general. Um, I think women have great opportunities today because, you know, gone are the days when our fathers used to think that they're the men of the house, so they have to look after the woman and the children and then the woman becomes like a housewife now today there are better opportunities there are greater opp opportunities i'm sitting in front of one of the best of all time presenters <laughs> in the country you know as a woman i think you've worked your way up here uh, you could have been any other woman you could have chose to be on the side of the street you could have chose to be anywhere but you chose to do this because you believe that you'd be able to send your message out there so you know enough respect to that anyway and uh, i feel like african women uh, Western women, all women have great opportunities. I look at some of someone like Oprah Winfrey, who is one of you know the people that I really appreciate. Where you know, with her being a victim to society, didn't kill her, didn't break her, but rather boosted her, um, motivated her, inspired her, and strengthened her mm -hmm. to sort of wanting to change every woman's life, adding every adding as much value as yeah. she can for every woman not to go through her situation, which is sacrificial. You know, today, uh, she's the richest woman in the world. You know, and one would think it's riches, again, it's wealth. You know, it's because of that genuine value that 
she decided to globally add to people, which I believe that a lot of African women stand, they stand this opportunity today. You know, we, we have people in Nigeria who are coming across hundreds of millions of dollars in other places where they can really affect or impact or change Africa's situation. Do you think women, women should be given more positions? Competent I, women? I think so, but I wouldn't agree with the word given. Okay. I think women should stand up for different positions. When, when you stand up sometimes, you're called all sorts of names. It doesn't matter. Right. The power in you determines your capacity and your ability. It's not the shape, it's not the look, and it's not the label. Mm. It's really the power in you. So if a woman is given a position, then they're still playing their old game. Like a husband telling a woman that you're the boss of the house before she becomes the boss of the house. You <laughs> right. know, it's gone. I think women should stand up and now show the world that we can also do what men do. And of course, men are already doing what we do. So, you know, it's an equal opportunistic uh, platform that we're all dealing on. And I think it's, it's, it's time. Of course, there's sort of things I've learned about women and this sort of pain, mental pain that they go through. You know, sometimes I wonder if a man can take a day to leave a day more if there was a baby in your stomach, <laughs> you know? But a yeah. woman can carry it for nine months. Right. You know, you women can, can wear high heels for 12 hours. <laughs> you know, you can do stuff yeah. that it's very difficult yeah. for nature to sort of say, this is my everyday life. Right. And that power in you, they call it strength of a woman. You know, I remember the first time I saw my wife give birth to my second born. And it was the first time that I saw a woman give birth, actually. So I put it on... You, you didn't have the guts to face, face it the first time. Listen, I faced it, <laughs> but I, put, I bought a number plate, a private plate to put on my car. It says X11X. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? It means 950, 10 to 10. Mm -hmm. That was the time the baby came out. Ah. So for me, that very moment, I cherish that very moment that God revealed me to what a woman have to go through just to bring another being in the world. And that whole creation of God having a human being in a stomach for nine months and four minutes, and it gave me a more natural sense of value to life, you know, which I think a lot of people are not doing. They take people for granted. They take human beings for granted. They even lie to put one person in trouble just to put some money in their pocket. But this is the value I'm talking about. This, is, this summarizes everything we're saying. How do you have value for life, for people? You know, that person is nine months in the stomach. He's now he's grown for another 10, 12 years, 20, 30 years. You don't know how much money one has invested in that person to grow. So who are you to use a minute to destroy them? Who are you to think that you can just pull them down? This is the sort of mindset that we should ask ourselves the questions, are we doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. You know, trying to have a, 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 some sort of westernized look country or continent. First of all, we need to get our mindsets right. We need to start to value our people. You know, I am tired of hearing the stories of slave trade and all this and that. Whatever trade and slave, whatever, is gone. You know, yesterday's problem is tomorrow's opportunity. I always tell people this. Whatever happened yesterday, tomorrow it can be an opportunity for us because we have to look at the positive side of it and stop blaming, stop relating it to the negativity. You know, uh, people want to look in the future, but there's nothing to look into the future if you can't see the future starting from today. Right. Is that the one thing you would like to change given the opportunity, the mindset? It's one thing I would like to do I couldn't change people's mindset. I could let them adapt to a situation and I could let them adapt to an attitude and a character that would eventually change a nation, mm. you know, but to change someone's mind sometimes is more like a brainwash kind of thing, which is not part of my religion. I don't believe in certain things. I don't believe in forcing things into people's mind because I think it's right. right. But I believe in people actually seeing what is right because the righteous live in the path that he understands well, better than the wicked or the fool.
Mm. You know, and I feel like it's a natural thing where I believe that I can add that value to society where they know that adding value to one another would make you become better than Anakwami Bediako, which is my sense of leadership, okay. making better leaders than I can make for myself. Right. Now, listening to you right from the beginning of the interview till now, you keep saying, my people, you know, changing the people, changing the way we behave. You almost sound like a man whose vision and ambition just transcends beyond just building these structures, like this one we are sitting in. Do you nurse any ambition, any political ambitions? Do you nurse any presidential ambitions to go straight to the point? <laughs> well, this, this reminds me of a verse in the Bible. It says, many are called, a few are chosen. Mm. And so is politics. I think real politicians, like I already said, that believe in a religion would only be who they want to be because it's a calling. And if I felt like I'm being called or I'm being ordained by God to lead my country because they need part of my wisdom that has been bestowed from up above to naturalize things and neutralize stuff. Yeah, it's, has it I, ever crossed your mind? It, it hasn't, but many people have asked me these questions when I speak. Mm. You know, I, I don't even know how to build a constituency or <laughs> I don't know anything about politics. Yeah. In fact, uh, I, well, I, we've seen people who knew nothing, absolutely nothing about politics, and they become world leaders. Like I said, you know, if you're called. many are called, a few are chosen. Mm. If I'm a chosen one, I wouldn't want to put myself in, uh, in some chair to be a leader, which I feel like most of the past leaders of our country or other African countries have been selected by people. They haven't been naturally chosen to lead a country. They have been preferred. Mm -hmm. So they were selected and after that they were controlled. But I pray to God that this is not the kind of path that I want to be on. Uh, I don't think I also want to be in power because I'm interested in running the state's affairs and mm. the state's wealth. I'm interested in changing the country to a better country and the people to a better, you know, a better people. But I don't have to be a president to do that. Really? Yes. If, if, I, if, if I have to be, then so be it. But I strongly believe that some of the things that I'm doing today should be uh, inspiring the young generation of today already to know that, yes, it's possible to do these things at a younger age than waiting for you to be older to do these things. Okay. However, if I have to be one day, I'm sure you'll be sitting right there in one of the cabinets. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let's take our very last break. We'll come back and talk to uh, Nana Kwame Bidiakon about his businesses, but also importantly, about youth unemployment in this country. Stay with us. Welcome back to State of Affairs. I'm still here with Nana Kwame Bidiakon, the president, founder, and CEO of Qualis Group. Now, I mean, tell us about your company. I, I understand you have Petronia in there, then you have these buildings as well. What exactly do you do? <laughs> <laughs> or what exactly don't you do? <laughs> well, that's a very bilingual question. <laughs> um, Basically, uh, we are developers, mm. mainly. Uh, but me heading the group, I'm the vision behind the group's imagination, okay. the group's concept, what they do, and how businesses are built. You know, I just play the advocacy, mm. you know, emporium kind of mm. stature mm. Behind, behind the group. And there is a part of the group which is Wonder World. Wonder World are the developers. Right. Then you have Petronia. Petronia is the large scale development company. Then you have New Africa Construction, which is called NAC, which okay. is New Africa Construction. Mm. Then you have uh, Belfast, right. 
which is city and property management. Then you have, of course, the New Africa Foundation, which we go around Africa feeding kits, 10,000 kits, depending on the country we pick. And we're looking to also do accommodations all around Africa. So coming back to maybe Belfast, uh, having a management portfolio is key when it comes to real estate. It doesn't matter in what sense, whether it's commercial, residential, or industrial. Mm -hmm. But you always have to have some sense of operators around the building for it to keep the legacy of longevity. Right. You know, so the building stays as a landmark, as you know, a long-term building that generates uh, revenue and so forth. Then I'm um, talking about NAC, New Africa Construction, and how to put it together because. Growing up in this industry, I realized that I couldn't use just Ghanaians to build such huge structures in terms of engineering and architecture. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they're not great architects in Ghana. They are. But it's very difficult to find the two together, a combination of engineers and architects who understand how to put a 16 or 20 floor buildings because we're not used to that. Right. I mean, we only have a few of it in Ghana. So if we want to turn Ghana to Dubai, we have to sort of incorporate ourselves and uh, integrate ourselves with such engineers and architects who are coming from the western part of the world that have done that already. Mm. So the experience is there right. and based on that the locals will learn from which is one of the things that I've initiated in the system. And then um, talking about Petronia, I don't know what went through my mind for me to get up one day and say I'm going to build a city but um, I know that he who that builds a house without God builds it in vain. And God gave me that vision, so uh, I, I believe that the country needs it. I believe that Takrade, which is the western part of Ghana, is by far one of the richest regions in the whole Africa. Why I say that is because it's the only region in even West Africa that has about 10 commodities or resources right. concentrated in one area, which tells you that that is the hub of Africa or West Africa because you have from gold to gas and oil, you have aluminum uh, which is bauxite, yeah. you have manganese, you have cocoa, you have rubber, palm, you name it. Everything is within the western and when you look at the other places next to it, there's Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast is even closer to Takradi than it is from Accra to Takradi. Yeah. So there is opportunity for cross-border movement, there is oil discoveries, there are gold, there are this and that. And so I realized in 2010 that God sent me there that this is going to be the hub. Go there and say you're building a city. I was just turning 30 and everybody thought I was mad. But now? Well, they're seeing it because I had to put 65 families, 12 chiefs, 12 subdivisional chiefs, and one overall chief together to be able to buy the land you know, which is called acquisition in the business. And it was a whole lot of movement, you know. Today, I think the country is beginning to realize that, yeah, whether it's Takradi or Tamale, we still need cities, yeah. you know. And of course, I predicted that in the next 20 years, Africa will come up with 20 cities. This is the future of Africa. These cities is the platforms that will help us to unite in a way of trading our resources and our commodities through manufacturing level, through industrial level. And so my way of thinking is never for myself. It had always been for the people. It's always been for the country. It's always been for the continent. And in a way, I see it as a corporate war, <laughs> which is, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It's not a crime to have a corporate war. You know, creating competition within the corporate entities there's nothing wrong with that. It's healthy. And I, I believe that we're here to make that change. Now, when you come to Accra, you see that we're building all sort of um, service apartment, fully serviced apartment. Why? Because I have decided to be the biggest competitor for hotels. That I know Africans are not going to be comfortable living in hotels, which is only 28 square meter. And so is the person who's coming from Europe or America. 28 square meters is done. You know, people don't travel to Africa with briefcases. They travel with suitcases. You're coming 8,000 mile, 8, miles away. You're not going to turn around the same day and go. You're going to stay here for two, three, four days. Of course, we need to give you a place that is comfortable enough to leave. And even if you had a girlfriend or a wife or a child, there has to be a place ready to leave. Whereas in the past, 
you had developers who were only interested in putting an apartment, leaving it empty, and somebody have to come and pay you one year, sixty, seventy thousand dollars, and then you spend another thirty thousand to furnish it. Now you tell me, if this is what you had to do to go to another person's country, would you be happy? You won't even go. It's difficult. So I wanted to stop that difficult lives that we're selling to people just because they're coming for our minerals and our resources. You know that makes them have a second mind of either snatching from us or stealing from us. I, I, I believe that being fair is just the definition of business. And so that's why my company decided to come up with all these fully serviced apartments, these buildings in the middle of the country, you know, Su, number one, Oxford Street, the Qualis apartment. Now we're going to graduate as a thousand apartment for people who will graduate from university. You know, um, things that people haven't thought of in the market you know, and they haven't thought of it because they thought, well, who wants to spend $45 million to do one building before they get paid $100? It's quite difficult, but then you need to think of the long term. And you also need to think of doing it right. And that's why we are the first company today in Africa that has brought in a company like Ascot, who are the best service um, apartment operators in the world, because they believe in our vision. They have been forced to come into the, onto the market in Africa, and it's because our development meets their requirements and their specifications. The quality should be guaranteed, first of all, and secondly, we should be able to do buildings which is quite competitive to whatever that is outside. And I mean, selling the five-star lifestyle, that's what I do. <laughs> okay. Now, what do you think about graduate unemployment again? I mean, the situation is so bad that there is a group called Unemployed Graduates of Ghana. Absolutely. I mean, we, we saw this problem coming up six years ago, and um, my company introduced Graduators, which was the first time that we wanted to sell a home to any graduate that will graduate from a university, but with a certain marks or certain grades between AAB or ABC or ABB or whatnot. I mean, something that qualifies them to be in any position in a country to have a job and to be able to own a home at the same time. You see, the biggest problem is that why would a parent or why would parents pay for their child to get a degree, spend three to four years of their life in university on their own, taking care of themselves, and then what happens after they get their degree? They move right back to their parents' house. This is the biggest mistake Africans are doing because when a child goes out, and they don't have a job. They have a home to stay, and they have food to eat. So they're only going to complain that they're not getting a job. But the actual empowerment, enforcement, to make sure that the government sees that this is a national uh, issue, you know, uh, it's not actually done, or it's not actually implemented. And so one of the things that we decided to do to sort of give it a good balance was to get the government involved with us whilst we create homes for these people. And of course, responsibility is the gateway to success. If one is not responsible for their life, they will never think of the ways and means to become successful. Mm -hmm. So one of the things to bridge this gap is what do we do to get these graduates to become responsible for their lives? And what do we do to have a combination of both the private sector and the government coming together and securing a job for these people. Because once they have a home to pay for, then automatically they have to have a job to work for. Then the differences of someone coming from Germany and someone coming from Ghana University who have the same degree, it's not going to be one is getting 10% and the other is getting 100%. Right. Okay, because the other person is being uh, uh, accepted as an expert. So maybe they need a little bit uh, extras here and there. But as for wages, it has to be the same because it's the same sort of yeah. degree, you know, the same sort of certificate. But over here, it's not like that. It's different. You know, people are still getting minimum wage when they come out of university. And if you don't pay people right, what you do is you strip every value out of the person. That person could be anyone. He could be a doctor. He could be a policeman. Could, if you give him pure water for bribe, he will take it. Because you've taken every value out of him. Right. One, he doesn't know how he's going to get a home one day. He doesn't have the chances to be in the debentures or the mortgage platforms. He doesn't have a way to get any credit or be part of any credit system. He doesn't have a future. He doesn't see his pension. He doesn't see anything. These systems are supposed to be created. However, 
I don't think it can only be created by just the government because the government have way too many issues for us to slap this on top of them that they should do it. I mean, you understand when someone has a lot of issues, they're already facing some sort of depression, you know, in terms of building systems. So what I think could be a good deal is the private sector thinking of the nation, as I've been speaking about, mm. creating this value and adding this value to them, making sure that there are things being done that is creating jobs for these people. And then the government automatically have to come in to support. By doing so, I think there could be a little bit of tweaking some of these laws to change it. You know, uh, a very good example is, like, I'm not going to mention any bank in particular, but banks are, have been institutionalized in our country with alliances to play like a church collection box. Excuse me, just come and put your deposit mm. in the bank. And then what are they doing with all these deposits? Right. There is no student loans. There is no loans whatsoever that you know, can give somebody a home. So this person needs to go and take a loan from some place and has to pay 20%. It's, it's just too much. I mean, it's, our system can never be built until these values are inserted. And employment will start booming if private sector is allowed to create certain platforms that will create this sort of opportunities for these people. And of course, I wish Ghana all the best. I love Ghana as a country. I love Africa as a continent. And I love my people. I love my race. I love my color. I love the world. But more so, today, we have our country, our continent, and our people to deal with. And I think we're responsible to make it work. And I feel like I'm one of the people to play a part in it. Absolutely. I've been chasing this man for over four years for this interview. Finally, it happened. Pleasure talking to you. Likewise. Nana Kwame Bidiapo. Thank you. Is the president, founder, and CEO of Qualis Group. This has been State of Our First. Thank you for watching. We'll see you on Thursday.